pleased that you got to hear from Erin today. Um, she, she could have uh, given herself a little more of a rap. Erin's actually the person who has been involved with this long study for its entire duration. She said to me last night that she checked her hours on the project and it was 2,000? Two and a half thousand hours Erin has spent on this project since 2007. So hence why she's with us today and she's able to answer any technical question that you can think of. <laughs> okay, so my name's Sarah Commons um, and it has been my privilege <coughs> to uh, have managed the uh, third and fourth phases of the Barmachoke study over the past three and a half years with Erin and others at SKM and within the authority in the States. Now, Keith, if you regard yourself as a bit of a whippersnapper with 23 years under your belt, um, I think that I'm certainly a little wet behind the, the ears if, <laughs> with my three and a half years on the Balmer Choke study. <clears throat> Look, I did want to take the opportunity today to acknowledge basically all that's come before the Balmer Choke study. Erin alluded to... Uh, to some of those activities dating back to the 40s with the construction of regulators in the forest. I did want to pay particular credit where it's due for the work of the Barma Malua Forum, which was active for a period of around 20 years from the mid 80s to the mid 2000s. Uh, and there has been correspondence since from particularly active individuals on that group, uh, just wanting to uh, you know, uh, ensure that we you know, see this through to a logical conclusion. Now, uh, the forum, I won't say a lot about it, except to say that um, it has been, I've seen it described as a brave experiment in agency and community cooperation. Um, was at times unwieldy to manage, I've read that. And uh, look, at some significant achievements were that the forum was, uh, was really, I think, instrumental in uh, fostering this attitude and, and keeping, you know, keeping encouraging governments to see and to manage the forest as one entity, see it as a whole, manage it as a whole. <coughs> and, you know, one, an example of an operating practice that stemmed from that was uh, the alternate sharing um, of um, acceptance of rain rejection flows from one side of the forest to the other, so as to, to spread the impact, so. And I, I guess the forum, oversaw the first and second use of the environmental water allocation. So they've, they have got a strong environmental theme and uh, that was really important work and, and building blocks that they put in place. And so you could regard that the Barma Choke study is in fact the next chapter, uh, I suppose. And uh, so yeah, the technical work really continued, um, as has been said, over the past five years um, under the the format or the, the ambit of the Barmachoke study. And all of the information arising from the Barmachoke study is available on the NDBA's website. Uh, that's dropped off there, but it's www.ndba.gov.au. <laughs> so uh, look, all of the reports from all of the phases are publicly available, so feel free to visit that site and have a look. So, where are we now? We are at a point where, in a reporting sense, the Barma Choke study has reached a conclusion in uh, 2012. <coughs> but that report does not <coughs> sit idle on the shelf. Uh, rest assured, there is active work to progress the recommendations arising from that study. Now, I'll just make some comments around the thinking for the two issues, the shortfalls and the unseasonal flooding. With the shortfalls, um, we now understand from the work of the study that um, mid-river operational flexibility is the key there. That's the key to mitigating the shortfall issue. And, um, and we're largely heading in that direction and uh, so that there is actually already good progress. So Erin mentioned the, the four components of option package one. Uh, the two that make the biggest difference for managing shortfalls are the way that we use the, I the intervalling trade uh, water, which sits in accounts on the Goulburn and the Murrumbidgee rivers, and also the way that we um, coordinate the management of mid-river weirs. So um, we're talking about Rumbury, Euston, 
Yeah, okay, so we're in that part of the river. In other words, uh, you know, using using the, the operating range there to lower and to raise weirs to, to help mitigate shortfalls. Uh, there is infrastructure works either underway or complete at Euston and Mildura weirs. Uh, now, just suggesting that these works may give us greater operational flexibility in the future if needed. Now, the second issue, the unseasonal flooding issue. So rest assured there is work underway there as well. Uh, so there is currently uh, work to investigate the feasibility of options for getting that extra 2,000 megalitres a day out of the Edward River Escape from Moella Canal. Uh, and there's also data analysis and modelling happening in parallel to that. Um, to that feasibility study around the potential use of that additional capacity. Erin's uh, mentioned this, but I'll just reinforce it, that um, there were commitments made uh, regarding Lake Mawala, and they absolutely still hold. There is no immediate plans for any uh, larger manipulations outside current operational ranges at Lake Mawala. And I did just want to mention another project which has, um, is in its formative stages. Um, so we're uh, working closely with, in fact, this gentleman in front of me and some others. <laughs> <laughs> this is about um, trying to get smarter with the way that we operate the regulators in the forest. Not that we're not already smart at doing it, but importantly, uh, just formalising, I suppose, those procedures and also writing them down. This is as much about a uh, uh, succession planning as anything else. Um, so look, there is, uh, just be aware that there is a project being scoped at the moment, which will actually build on um, <coughs> previous work, um, including that which Ben discussed earlier, uh, the, model, the development of a modelling tool. So in fact, um, invite Keith to say a few words on this in a moment. He's really the guru on this project. But um, but largely it's about um, thinking about regulate, uh, how we operate the regulators, both in seasonal times and also unseasonal times, and uh, using tools such as the hydrodynamic model um, to actually test different scenarios there and ultimately develop you know, the best, pra best practice operating procedures. So, um, the Barma Choke is a really important feature of the river, which um, the operators, the river operators at the authority and in the states consider each and every day. Um, and be aware that they do strive, they really strive to alleviate the issues associated with the choke for people, um, as in the shortfalls, and also for the forest um, to not, so as to not do harm by uh, contributing to unseasonal flooding. But importantly, uh, also strive to maintain the benefit of the choke to the forest. Um, the choke is the reason the forest exists. Um, an example for you would be the operations this year. The operators have targeted um, lower flows through the choke, and this is in recognition of the importance of having some room to move in the event of a, a rain rejection, um, just recognising the importance of giving the forest a dry, a drying cycle this year. In terms of next steps, um, this work will now need to be seen in the light of a basin plan as we move toward the vision of a healthy working river. So a question that you may well ask is, um, will the choke constrain operations into the future? As Erin alluded to, um, there is no definitive answer to that question as yet. It depends on a lot of things, including how you operate the system. Um, and what I've got. It depends 
particularly on how the environmental demands are specified and where the water is in the system. Uh, so keep in mind, so just encourage you to think from a system scale just for a moment. So when, um, when water resources are plentiful in the Mindy Lakes, um, when there's good inflows from the Murrumbidgee and Golden tributaries, these are times when typically the uh, challenges and constraints around the bum choke are not a problem for management. Um, also, keep in mind, so that relates to when I said it depends where the water is. In terms of specifying environmental demands, um, so there is a key message in here for those of you involved in environmental water planning. Just be mindful that when you're specifying um, icon site demands, just be mindful of how that looks from a system perspective. Um, some of the earlier modelling that, that was done around this study did indicate that um, you know, if, if uh, there were demands in the warmer months in the lower river, such as maintaining a flow through the Murray mouth over summer, this may in fact actually contribute to um, issues at the, at the Barma Choke. So, and that can occur, you know, ironically at the same time that um, irrigation entitlements might be reducing. So in, in fact, you've almost got substitution of an environmental demand for an irrigation <coughs> demand, so the problem still persists. So please just give that an ounce of thought when you're specifying individual site demands. And also know that um, there are clauses within the Murray-Darling Basin Agreement that would in fact prevent, uh, that would prevent the MDBA from deliberately um, unseasonally flooding the forest. So that would be taken into account as well. So yeah, holistic, uh, we, we think about people and we think about the forest. Whole of system, as I said, that's your take home message. Just keep that perspective in mind when you're thinking about and specifying icon site environmental demands. And also be aware that uh, there is most certainly a, a strong intention to work with local people as we uh, continue uh, on this journey with the Barman Choke study and, and what comes after it. And certainly we're interested in working with people such as those in this room to get the best science and ecology into improved river operations in the future. So yeah, on that note, I, I would acknowledge everyone in this room for the great work that you're doing. Um, and I've certainly taken notes about particular individuals that I need to catch up with because there's snippets of good advice amongst the work that I believe that we can feed into improved revolves. So thank you everyone.